Blender in its latest 2.8 series has changed quite a bit. So much so that it can be a bit daunting to get working in it, even if already familiar with Blender's previous version, 2.79. The good news though, is that all that 2.79 knowledge hasn't gone to waste since many, many things have actually stayed the same. So after you know what shortcut keys have changed or been removed, where things have moved around in the interface and how to take advantage of the improvements, you'll then be fully unleashed into the new and improved world of Blender 2.8 and see why Epic, Ubisoft and many others in the industry are happy to be on board, helping to push it even further into 2.81 and beyond. This video is a general overview of changes pretty much too hard not to notice or perhaps just too important or cool to leave out in our view. These changes are the sort you'll probably come up against whatever you happen to use Blender for. Still, there may be more you want us to take a look at though, so just let us know. We can get Blender 2.8 in the usual places. For example, you should be able to find it right on the blender.org homepage. Clicking on the current banner at the top shows the latest additions, in this case 2.81a. On the download tab, we'll find several download options. The main release should be front and center, but we can also scroll down to find the bleeding edge section. Basically, this is where we'll find the latest daily build of the next version along. And we can find that at the builder.blender.org slash download page. That's not official yet, of course. That's currently experimental and should be used at your own risk as the code is a work in progress. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest updates, then check out this link for the release notes as they happen. Once we've downloaded, installed and finally launched Blender, we should be greeted with this nice new bright splash screen from the Spring Open Movie Project, finally replacing our dark space VFX black hole beta image, which was a bit of a surprise that they used that actually, but we were super made up about it. And also it's quite poetic now because from the darkness of that black hole comes the light of spring. The key thing to note here is that there should be a quick setup section on the lower half. Now, if you don't actually have that, it probably just means you have some old prep and settings that Blender is reading instead, as you're only gonna really gonna get this the first time you load up Blender. I'm running this on Windows, so those settings are gonna be stored just here in one of the subfolders of this 2.80 t folder. But if we were to rename this or delete it entirely, when we next start up Blender, this is what we're gonna see and Blender will automatically recreate all this folder for us once we've finished with our session here and all the preference changes that we might like to make. For creating tutorials though, I'm just gonna be using all the new defaults. Now, if we click on the splash screen or outside of the splash screen, basically somewhere within Blender, we can get that splash screen back by coming over to the Blender icon there and just finding splash screen here. I'm just going to click again though, because all those options that were being asked for on that lower half of the splash screen, we can actually find ourselves in the edit menu under preferences. We just drag that down and we find our key map section here. We're gonna find all the options for whether we want to select with the left or right mouse button, what we want the spacebar to do, the hotkey profile. So for example, we've got the Blender 2.8 new defaults here. We've got the old 2.7 series here and we've also got an industry compatible option. For more on that industry compatible key map, you can follow this link here and you'll see the general motivation and results of that. So for example, if all of these various applications happen to use the left mouse button, then the winner of that is left mouse button. And that's what got adopted into the industry key map. Another option on that splash screen was the theme, whether we want it light or dark. And for that, we can just switch over to our themes and find our presets here. Something I don't think we're gonna be able to get though, if we come back to our splash screen, is our ability to load our 2.79 settings. So if we're looking to do that, we're probably going to need to delete this folder as was mentioned before. Something else that I'd like to mention in our edit preferences menu is just these three lines down in the bottom left corner, what's often referred to as the burger bun or something like that. You can see if we click on this, we've got the auto save preferences auto enabled, meaning that any changes that we make in here are automatically being saved. This is unlike 2.79 where you had to manually make that save. So let's close these preferences here. And now that we're inside of Blender, we can get through with all these changes in the interface. So the layout for 2.8 is no longer Windows based. So for example, here in 2.79, the entire interface is simply a combination of various windows. So even this stuff at the top with file render window is actually just a header bar of another window, as we can see up there, if we pull it down. That's the info window. And we could switch that to a 3D view if we wanted to. And now if we pull it down again, 
we can see that. And we can also see now there's nowhere in the interface where we get that file menu anymore. Over in 2.8, this is no longer the case. Now here we have a designated top bar. And if I hover the mouse for the double arrows here and try and pull down, we're not gonna kind of reveal a hidden window at the top there. Also notice there's this bottom status bar as well, which gives us information about our scene and some prompts for what we might want to do at this very moment. So right now what we're looking at is actually four windows. We have our 3D view, the timeline, the outliner, and the properties window. So the configuration of the windows that we have here is basically the same as 2.79. It's just we only have four windows now instead of the five because what was this fifth window at the top now is its own designated top bar. Something else that could cause confusion in 2.79 was the fact that our tool shelf that we have on the left here that we can toggle with the T key kind of looks like its own window. Whereas over in 2.80, these are our tools that we're toggling on again with the T key that hasn't changed. But we can clearly see now that these tools belong to this 3D window. Perhaps for beginners, it's probably better if this was actually sort of expanded a little bit just so you can read the names of what we've got there. But we'll be coming back to this in a little bit more detail later. The major thing that I want to drill in at this stage is that with these windows, it's always been very, very easy to get in a crazy mess. So for example, in 2.79, we can see these three diagonal lines just in the top right corners of each window. And this is an area where we can split from basically. So we can left click and drag to the left. We can also left click and drag down and split it vertically instead of horizontally. In 2.80, the same risks are kind of there, but the major change here is that instead of just using the top right, we can now use any corner of a window to be able to split it. I always encourage people to spend a little time getting the hang of splitting and joining windows in Blender like this, so you don't end up in Doctor Strange's multiverse window layout from before. Manually creating a kind of expert mode single window layout is always a pretty good task. And by the way, we can toggle a kind of super expert mode with control, alt and space. If you get really stuck with the windows layout, you can go to file, new, and then select the general workspace. If you have something you want to save, then save it. But I'm going to discard these changes here though. Now you have a nice Windows layout again with this default workspace. You can then go to File, Open, and choose not to load any potential crazy UI that the Blend file was saved with. We have another way we can reset our Blender 2, but this has a further reaching impact than just the interface. So say if we change other preferences too, such as enabled a bunch of add-ons and changed the resolution size of the interface to something you could read from the moon, then doing what we did before with just file, new, and then general isn't going to cut it. To really reset, we're gonna to want to go to file, defaults, load factory settings. But again, note that this is a full reset. So all the preferences changes we've made uh, are gonna be reset along with the layout. Other pretty noticeable interface changes are within the 3D view itself. So for example, like this infinite 3D view grid. Over in 2.79, it looked more like this. And if we went down to the view menu and opened up the properties sidebar and came over to the display area, you'd find the details for the grid there. Over in 2.80, if we go up to that same menu, the view menu, it's not the properties sidebar anymore. It's just a sidebar and it's the same key, N, to toggle it on and off. But over here, we won't find anything for this grid in any of these tabs for this sidebar. Instead, if we close that again with the N key, we'll actually find this in these new menus over here. So if we click on here, we can find the scale and we'll find the subdivisions as well. This tool shelf or tool bar, as it's now named and can still be toggled on and off with the T key, of course, works differently than it does in 2.79. In 2.79, some of the fundamental tools sort of were broken or behaved in a very strange way, at least. Say we wanted to engage the scale tool. If we were to click that, it launches us into the actual operation straight away where probably what we wanted to do is just sort of switch over to the scale tool like this. Over in 2.8 though, it behaves a little bit more predictably. In fact, our default tool that we're given now is this select tool. In fact, let's pull this out a little bit, left click and drag here so we can see the words. And when we switch through these various different tools, you can see rather than engaging the tool, we're kind of activating it ready for use instead. So that's probably behaving a little bit more intuitively. So you can see we're set to select box 
and you can see these little triangles in the bottom right corner of a couple of these tools. What that means is we can left click and hold there and you'll see different select options and select box is the second one down. So that behaves very much like the B key. So we can just left click and drag across the view here. In my opinion, this is really good because it means that the selection can be left as just a default tool without having always to press B to border select, for example. And also you're not gonna move something accidentally. So in 2.79, if we were to right click on this and drag a little bit, we're in danger of actually moving it when we might not have actually meant to do that. I'm just gonna left click on this cube and then tab into edit mode. We'll see that the toolbar expands to show extra tools. And I just wanted to quickly note that, say if we choose our 3D cursor tool, which now means that when we left click somewhere in the screen, we're gonna move the 3D cursor, which is kind of similar to what 2.79 was doing by default. If we tab back out of edit mode into object mode, we'll switch back to the select box. So we'll have different active tools depending on what state we're in. So in object mode, right now we're in select, and then tabbing into edit mode jumps us back to the cursor. I think things can still be a bit confusing though. For example, you can be in circle select mode. So if I left click and drag on here and select select circle from there, we get this little circle where our mouse pointer was. And then if I left click and drag, you can see that we're adding the vertices to the selection there. But if we were to middle click, we're actually just rotating around the view. Whereas if we were to press C to enter the circle tool, if I scroll the middle wheel now, you can see we're actually changing the size of that. And then if I left click, you can see it's still making a difference. If I middle click, I'm now starting to subtract from the selection. So I've kind of got two sort of circle selects happening with different key controls. So I think that's a little bit confusing at the moment. Something that is an added advantage though, is that if I just press escape to exit the circle select that we engage with the C key, you can see that this particular mode here allows us to still rotate around the view, which is something that you can't really do when you engage the tool with this. So we're locked to this one position in the camera until we actually end the tool. Pressing W is going to toggle us through the different select modes, as you can see there, select circle, select lasso. Here's our select move, so we can just left click and drag and it'll automatically move it. Press W again, just to bring us back to the select box. That's actually pretty useful to bear in mind because as W was a key you pressed a lot in 2.79 for the specials menu, you might find yourself accidentally changing Changing that select mode. Interestingly, something that's quite cool is that you can keep this toolbar closed with T and actually just get that at the location of the cursor by using shift space. And we can see all the hotkeys associated with these here. So one way to get to the cursor, for example, is just to hit spacebar. So if we did that quickly, we can go shift space to space again. Now we're setting the 3D cursor position. And if I was to go shift space and then press B without moving the mouse, we're now back into our select box. Something to worth noting as well is that we can actually just set the 3D cursor anyway with, with shift and right click without actually swapping tools. For those who like to see the move gizmo, so let's press T to open this up here. So if we wanna keep select box active or as our active tool, but still be able to move easily enough by just pressing G, but actually also see the move gizmo. So for example, something that we can easily see if we just switch to this here. Now, of course, we've switched away from the select tool. So let's click that back. And what we can do instead is we can just come over to this viewport gizmos menu and just enable our move right there. So now we've still got our box select, but now we also have our move gizmo. Personally though, I probably would rarely use that. And again, that could be seen as a little confusing because if we switch to say the rotate tool, we now no longer see the move gizmo, but of course here we still have move set. So that's just another little something to bear in mind. Over in 2.79, we had mostly only two places to be able to find a lot of properties related things. So if we pressed N to open up our properties sidebar, we could find some properties here and some tool related things here potentially, and also some tool related things over on the tool shelf. In the properties window, we could find some more properties related things. And note, we have our different tabs aligned horizontally here. Over in 2.8, we have our properties window here, but the tabs are stacked vertically this time. And as for the tools and where they may be, they're in quite a few places. So we have our toolbar here. We have our N key, which also comes with these various tabs here now as our main sidebar. We also have an additional tab in this properties window, which is called the context and tools tab. And in here we can find some tool related things as well. So let's say switch to the bevel tool. We'll see various different options here. We can also come to the tool tab within our sidebar here. And you might think why have it in two places? And it's just potentially you might like to work in a particular way. It's just duplicated in a few places just to facilitate different kinds of workflow. 
Something else we should probably look at, if we right click somewhere up here, we can go to header and show tool settings. We'll then get tool related options across the top. So with all of this in these different areas, this could be seen as a little confusing, but I think the real goal of it is to just be versatile for different kinds of workflow, especially those that are trying to stay in a single window, which we can toggle with control space. As for the 3D cursor here, we may be able to see that the 3D cursor is actually a 3D object now, meaning as we can see in the tool settings up here that we have surface project enabled and its orientation is view. So if I left click and drag on here, we can see it's aligned to the camera's view there while also stopping at the surface of the object. If we set the orientation to actually the geometry and left click again, we can see it's aligned nicely to that cube space. That becomes more useful for perhaps a slant. So what I'm going to do is find our select box, left click and drag across there, press G and then Y, and then just slide that out to about here. And then let's come back over to the cursor tool, left click there, let's switch to our move tool. And then over here, we can see where our transform orientations, and I'm going to set to the 3D cursor. And this gizmo we can see is aligned to the orientation of this face that we clicked on. Something that's improved with the 3D cursor is that if we left click and drag, it just places the 3D cursor where the position was at the point that you first clicked. In 2.8 though, should we be in the 3D cursor, we can just left click and drag and it will move position. Or if we were just in the select box and we shift and right clicked, we can still do that. Up here we have our snapping, which I've set to vertex, or we can use control shift tab as a hotkey and place it at the position of the cursor. And then if we shift and right click and drag, we can hold control and then it'll just snap to different places on this cube or the different vertices in this case. And if we tap into object mode, we can do the same thing there. Shift, and right click, drag around where we want it, hold control to maybe snap to this vertex and then right click and then set origin to the 3D cursor. So we have better accuracy with this while still in object mode. Something that wasn't really possible in 2.79. In 2.79, if we dig in a little bit, so on the tool shelf, we come down to Grease Pencil, we can find under our tools, the ruler and protractor. And for left click and drag, we can find the numerical value of a certain distance and then just escape to exit that. In 2.80, this same kind of tool is a little bit more prominently positioned. So if we left click on this to activate the tool and then left click and drag in the view, we get that same kind of measurement. We can left click in the middle somewhere to add an angle and then we can left click and drag on the points to sort of reposition. And as I've just clicked on this one, I can just simply hit delete to remove those points. Where this becomes pretty useful is to left click and then hold control to snap to that vertex there. I'm going to left click on this other end and then hold control to snap to the other end and now we have the exact measurement of that edge or perhaps we want to hold control to snap it to there left click in the middle of it and then snap that to there now we know that angle is 91 degrees again just to get rid of it i'm going to hit delete in 2.79 we had down at the bottom here these various different viewport shadings for example wireframe solid and rendered in 2.8, this stuff is no longer at the bottom. It's now moved up here, which is way more together actually. So just to clean things up a little bit, I'm gonna close this active tool. Let's switch back over to the select box. We could right click up here and change the header setting here, or just go to the view menu and turn off the tool settings that way. And here we have our wireframe mode and we also have the solid shading, which we were in anyway. And we've also got this new mode called look dev and our rendered mode. Look dev and rendered mode are taking advantage of the new EV rendering engine and we'll be going over that in a lot more detail in another video. Be aware that the Z key, which used to toggle between wireframe and solid shading mode, will now in 2.8 bring up our Pi menu and wireframe is on the left and solid shading is on the right. Now on the same hotkey, we can also switch to rendered or look dev mode. Things are more nicely together now. So rather than them being in the property sidebar, a lot of the options for what we're going to see in the viewport can be found with this down arrow to the side here. Right now we're in lock dev. So these are the settings relating to that. But over in solid shading, we'll get a lot more settings, things such as back face culling. We also have these two menus, something that we looked at briefly before for our viewport gizmos and this one for the general viewport overlays. Again, as we briefly looked at before with the grid. I think it's worth mentioning about the X-ray mode, which is this button up here. In 2.79, that's the same X-ray button that you can see in edit mode, just at the bottom here. And if we toggle that on and off, you can see it enables us to be able to select through the object. And over in 2.8, we can toggle that with Alt Z, but I'll be going over some more hotkey changes shortly. 
Something I wanted to quickly add to this section on the X-ray, if we enable that, is that we can use our pull down menu here just to adjust how much of the X-ray we kind of see. In 2.79, under the Scenes tab of the Properties window, we had this Units area, and we were normally just set to None. And if we wanted to set things to Metric, for example, now we can see that's zero meters. Over in 2.8, I'll press N to open up our sidebar here. And let's go up to the item, and you can see the meters are already there. And if we go over to this Scenes tab of this Properties window, you can see we're already set to Metric. And we also have some further options here. For background images in 2.79, just to demonstrate this, I'm going to switch from this default Windows layout over to the UV editing and just squeeze that over a little bit. And I'm just going to drag in from a file browser externally to Blender this concept art image from the robot, just so that you can see what that is. And then in the 3D view, if we press N to open up our property sidebar here, we can find we've got background images in its own little section and we can enable that add image and since we already dragged it in we can use our pull down to find that robot concept image already as an option in our scene or i could actually just click and drag from a file browser straight into the window here and it would add it for us and so i can just press x on that previous one we almost added and you can see the axis that we're going to be able to see this is set to all views so if i press zero to jump into the camera or one to take a look at front orthographic view and we have all these various different options so let's move over to 2.80 and probably the first thing that springs to mind is that on our sidebar with the N key, we don't actually have any area in which the background images can be seen here. So I'm going to close that again with the N key. And instead, what I'll do is jump over to the UV editing workspace. And I'm going to left click and drag in that image again into here. And now for background images within the 3D view, there's a couple of places where you can do it. We can go shift A and add in an image here, a reference or a background, or we could add an empty with an image and these are all basically the same it's just the settings are slightly different there's another way we can add in an image as well and that's taking a look at our camera here so i have this selected and then i can come over to background images here just make sure this is enabled and then from this pull down here, I'm going to set that concept art that we had. And now when we press zero to look through, we can see there's our image in the background there. Or we could set that to be actually in front. The alpha slider is here. We can set it to fit instead of stretch and a load of the other settings that we used to from 2.79. If I rotate out of that camera though, and take a look from one of the orthographic views, like one, three, and seven on the numpad. We can see we don't have any background images there. So this is where we can go shift A and add in an image as a reference or a background. But since I've already opened this image here, I'm just gonna left click and drag from here and just drag it into the 3D view. And now we have that image as a physical object in our scene, which is basically just an empty displayed as an image. And we can set our size here, tell it whether we want to use transparency or not, whether we want it as a background image, in which case we want to put it as back. And we have a similar set of uh, useful tools that we had as we do in 2.79. In 2.79, if we wanted to shade something flat or smooth, often we might come to the tool shelf here, shading for smooth or flat. We might also tab into edit mode and go control F, find our faces menu, and we've got shade smooth and flat there as well. Over in 2.80, I can rotate out of that top orthographic view and let's take a look at this cube. But with this image here, I'm just going to uncheck the display in a perspective mode so that we can't see that anymore. Here we can simply select the object and right click it and we get shade smooth and flat right at the top of that menu there. And if we tab into edit mode and go control F, we can see we still have our shade smooth and shade flat there. In 2.79, we had this option in the header of the 3D view, which was to auto merge vertices that were moved to the same location. So if I simply double tap G to slide that along towards the same location of this other vertex, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It has automatically merged those two vertices into just one. Over in 2.80, we don't have that option down there anymore. And we don't have that option in the header here with the rest of the 3D view options there. Now we'll find it within the tools. So we can press N to open up our sidebar. We can pop down to the tools tab, open up the options, and we can find our auto merge there. We should also be able to see it in the usual tools areas that we have now, the multiple places we can find it. So for example, in our properties window, we have some options there too. And as I toggle this, you'll see it's updates in both places. Over in 2.79 for ambient occlusion to help us to see the proximity between objects and general curvature of our mesh, we'd come over to the property sidebar and enable ambient occlusion there. 
can crank it up. In this case, just to make it more obvious, so recessed areas of our mesh become more apparent and we can see it's hovering just above this plane there. I'm gonna shift select both of these objects, go control C to just copy them. Let's take it over to 2.80, delete the cube with X, control V to paste those in. And then what we can do is let's take a look at where we'll find our ambient occlusion. So we're not gonna see it in our property sidebar or the generic sidebar, I should say. Instead, where we'll find it is in this pull down menu under cavity. So if we select that, we'll see we're on a type screen, which is not what we were seeing in 2.79, by the way, that is more of a world type. And then I can increase the strength of that valley there to 2.5, or we can type a value much higher if we like, clicking in the field. We also have this ridge option, which is going to highlight the more exposed areas as well. So we have this other type screen, but we can also combine them with that both option. And bear in mind, we also have this little cog icon, which allows us to change some settings as well. If we wanted to render this masterpiece in 2.79, we might find ourselves coming over to the render buttons here in the render tab of the properties window. Over in 2.80, if we find that same area here, you're not going to find that render button. In fact, it's probably worth mentioning that we also have some extra settings in this output tab that we may have been used to seeing in our render tab. Instead, we can use our shortcut keys F12 to render as we did in 2.79, or we can come over to the render menu and we have our options there and it's probably worth worth also mentioning that over in 2.79 we also had these buttons here which we could just take a screen grab essentially of what we were looking at over in 2.80 we don't really have that in the interface as such we'll instead find that in a menu in the view menu where we'll see viewport render image and the animation there so if we just click on that we can now save our masterpiece with ease Many hotkeys have stayed the same. However, there are some crucial ones that have changed and some others that have been removed as it was felt that there was just too many hotkeys already assigned, that there was just barely any space for you left to assign your own. So for an official list of changes, we can find this link here and we're gonna go over a bunch right now. We can use control space to go full screen now on any given window. So wherever your cursor happens to be, it's control space to toggle that to maximize it or minimize it. We can find some camera settings with the accent grave key, which is to the left of my number one key above the QWERTY keyboard. And we get these options here in this pie menu. So left orthographic, for example, and if we hit it again, I can go to the top view. These are conveniently placed, of course. So if we quickly wanna take a look from the left orthographic view, we can just hit it and go left. So these pie menus are really good for gestures like that. We can also go shift and accent grave to enter into this first person camera type view where we can control our camera with the W, A, S and D keys. In fact, if you take a look right down at the bottom on that status bar there, you can see all the keys that we can use to help with controlling this. So to confirm the new position, I can just press the left mouse button. We have the A key to select all. And now as is common with a lot of operations, Alt A is the inverse of it. So that's gonna deselect all. It's worth noting that we still have A and we can double tap A to deselect everything. It was quite common in 2.79 that you'd probably be tapping A quite a lot anyway until you definitely got what you needed. Regarding the A toggling selection for all or deselecting all, we can go to the edit preferences and find the setting under the key map which is select all toggles. So instead of that double tap behavior, it behaves basically like it did in 2.79, but I'm gonna stick with the defaults on that. So I'm going to deselect that option. It's probably worth noting that the G key, the R key and the S key still do the same things. And also that tab is the same. That can toggle us between object and edit mode. Control tab now gives us this mode selection. As mentioned earlier, F12, We'll still render, but the button in the render tab of the properties window is gone, or in this new output window, we'll not find those buttons there either. The viewport render is in this view menu. Again, as mentioned earlier, the spacebar will now play our animation. And so the search that was on the spacebar, we can find with F3, and there's play animation right at the top of the list there. When we perform an operation, so G and then left click to confirm that position, we used to have F6 to be able to bring this information to the location of the cursor. Now it's going to be on F9. The user preferences, probably an easy way to get to that is by using the F4 menu. As we can see it down there at the bottom, preferences. 
On the Z key, we have the shading pie menu. Instead of just a toggle between wireframe and solid, we can also use Shift Z to toggle the wireframe mode and Shift Z again, just to toggle it back to whatever you had it on. So if we were on rendered mode, for example, and then I went Shift Z, it's gonna take us to wireframe and then Shift Z again, it'll knock us back to what we had before, which was this rendered mode. The pie menu is good as well because we could just Z and gesture to the right to quickly put us into solid shading mode. And if we want to take a look at X-Ray, we can go Alt Z and that's basically like enabling this option up here. So if I press Alt Z again, you can see that's toggling up at the top. That's useful because if we tap into edit mode, let's use Alt A to deselect everything and then left click and drag across everything we can see there. And then if we take a look, we can see that we've not actually selected everything on the cube which might have been something we wanted to do. So that's where that X-ray might come in handy. So Alt Z, and then let's do that again. And we can see we're definitely getting all the vertices there. If in doubt, of course, bottom right here, we can see that we have all eight of eight vertices selected. And then Alt Z to quickly toggle that back. If we click on this button here, that's going to disable some of these things in the viewport here. And the same would happen with these viewport overlays, which gives us a nice clean view. If we hover the mouse over this option though, you can see that the shortcut for that is control and that accent grave. And if we hover over this one, you can see it actually doesn't show us the shortcut key for that. But what we can do is we can use Shift, Alt and Z to toggle that back and to. And that's a quick way to toggle those overlays. To switch between vertices, edges and faces, it used to be that control tab menu, which is now this mode menu. These are pretty easy to remember. It's just the one, two and three keys. One for vertices, two for edges, three for faces. We can also use shift and those numbers to increase the ways that we can select there. So now we could select the face, but also I could simply just select that vertex. And now if we just press one on its own, it'll just revert back to just selecting vertices again. If I double tap G to slide this vertex on top of this other one, we've now got two vertices in the same space. So if I go Shift Z to enter into our wireframe mode and left click and drag across these two vertices, here's where in 2.79 we would use our remove doubles command, but in 2.80 instead we can right click and find our merge vertices and we'll find by distance or we can use the hotkey alt m it's much more sensible considering these as a merge operation of course so alt m and then by distance and then we can see in the status bar we've removed one of those vertices now we'll go shift z to toggle back to the solid shading view if i was to press three to enter face select mode select this face and go control f I might like to try and flip that face. You'll see that that option isn't there anymore. What we now have is this normals menu. So I can go Alt N and we have flip at the top there. You'll see that nothing really happened to the viewport there. So we can check this in a couple of ways. I can go up to this menu here and select a back face culling and Alt A to deselect that face. There's an additional way to do that now as well though, which is to take a look at our viewport overlays and we can see under the geometry option, there's face orientation and that's gonna color everything that is facing outwards blue and everything that is facing away from the camera. If we uncheck our back face culling, it is red and very obvious to notice. I'm gonna come back to the overlays menu though and uncheck that face orientation re-enable the back face culling, select everything with A, and then to recalculate our normals, which was control N, which is now new file, what we can use now is shift N, and that's our recalculate normals tool. For animating, I'm just going to left click on this time slider here, drag it back to the start, or we can use shift and right arrow or shift and left arrow to quickly do that. While here, we can still use I to insert various different keyframes. So for example, let's set the scaling there. Let's move over to the data tab of the properties window and you can see there we've got our scale keyframe set. But also you'll notice towards the right here, we can see with these little dots, which fields can be animated. And of course the larger diamonds here to show us that we have actually got some keyframes happening on these values. Let's enlarge in the timeline a little bit. And we can see we also have a keyframe in here, which can also be left click and dragged around, which we couldn't do in the old timeline. As to left click and drag in here would actually change to the current frame. To do that now, we can just shift and right click just to drag around in here to, to set the current frame, or we can grab it from its head, which is what I did just a moment ago. The Alt scroll wheel is still there. So I'm just holding Alt and scrolling on the mouse wheel, but we don't have that shift and up arrow to be able to change frames 10 frames at a time. And as you know, we have space to now play the animation. That is to say, if we go F4, check our preferences that we have actually got play set in our spacebar action section, which as I'm keeping everything at default, that's what we've got.
All right, let's take a look at some additional handy features that 2.79 doesn't have. So following on from hotkeys, we have quick favorites, which is accessed with the Q key. Right now there's nothing there and it actually helps us. It just says right click on buttons to add them to this menu. So for example, if we go object, transform, and then let's say randomize transform, let's right click on that. And we have add to quick favorites, which I've left clicked on. And now if I press Q, you can see we have random transform as an option. So we can click on this and maybe indicate exactly what we want our random location to be. Or perhaps we might want to try different seeds. Something that's worth noting about this, if we tab into edit mode, this is now going to have a different quick favorites menu. So if we hit Q now, you can see that it has some context sensitivity. So again, for this, we might want to go mesh, transform, and then right click on randomize and add that to our quick favorites. So now when we go Q, we have our randomize again, which is operating on the vertex level right now tab out into object mode and we'll find that we still have that randomized transform in our object menu. To demonstrate our back face culling, I'm going to delete this cube and replace it with a plane so that we can look underneath. And what we want is not to be able to see that face if we're culling that back face. So let's find it in the solid shading menu here to the right. We're using this arrow, we can find back face culling and that does exactly what we'd expect. Once we flip over to look dev or rendered mode though and use the full bells and whistles of Eevee, we'll see if we look underneath in fact, it's not immediately obvious. Let me grab this lamp and bring that below. You can see we can actually still see the back face. So I'm going to select our plane here, jump over to the materials tab in the properties window. Just make sure we have a material on this actually. Then I'll scroll down and we'll find the back face calling within the settings per material there. So let's just place this lamp a little bit closer. Shift D to duplicate another one above. And then we can clearly see that the back face is cold. I'm going to left click and drag from the top right here and split the view. I'm going to change this window into a shader editor, select the plane and just note that under the options here, we have some of those settings that are being reflected in that material tab as well. These sorts of things are really useful to try and keep you in as few windows as possible, therefore not cluttering up the general workspace. If you're very new to Blender or you're on a laptop without a numpad or you're using a pen and tablet, then this little area in the top right might be of use. So for example, we have this axis wheel over here that we can just left click and drag in and that kind of acts as the middle mouse button rotating around our view. We can also click on these individual points here, the red X, the green Y and the blue Z to align our view with the axis. There's also these buttons to the side. This one is going to toggle our perspective and orthographic views. This is going to jump into our camera or out again. And this, if we left click and drag on it, that's going to pan around. And this one, finally, our magnifying glass is going to zoom us in and out of the scene. In 2.8, we have these better on-screen helpers, kind of gizmos that we can use to help control the action that we're trying to make. If I tab into edit mode on this cube and select, for example, extrude region, and I'm going to come over to face select, select this face here. And now obviously you can see that there's this yellow line protruding from the face that we have selected with this plus at the end. I can just left click and drag on that just to extrude out a face. Or we can select this face and left click and drag on it. And again, extrude another face. Other gizmos can be found on some of the other tools. For example, on the spin tool is a very good one, very handy. So for example, we can now click on this plus icon to spin out some extra edges there, but you'll notice its pivot position is just placed at the origin. So we can use these axis handles here to replace that and put that somewhere where it might be a little bit more sensible. And then we can click on this circle that's appeared to kind of refine the angle that we have there. This is way easier to handle than it was in 2.79. Another one that might be worth taking a look at is the shear tool. Another gizmo appears with this face selected. And here we can just begin to make that shear command depending on which handle we grab and want to use and manipulate. It's not just for mesh stuff though. We can tap into object mode and take a look at this lamp. Come over to the lamp settings in the properties window. I'm going to change this to a spot. I notice there's some gizmos here to help control, in this case, the size of the spot shape. For a full look at all the changes within Blender 2.80, you can check this link here. We're gonna lean on the modeling options just for a moment and we can see all the cool stuff that we've got here. 
In fact, the major chapters are just in this top right here. But multi-object editing is definitely a big advantage. So simply shift D to duplicate a few of these and then we can shift select them all and then tab into edit mode and switch between each object really easily. One of the benefits of this, of course, is we can go shift Z, left click and drag across these and then go S, X and then zero just to flatten them all together so they're all nicely aligned without having to do that manually or bring in the 3D cursor where really we shouldn't have to. Going back to the documentation on here, it is worth mentioning that there are a few limitations to this, for example, with the knife tool and the select similar regions. Something that's very cool navigation wise is that while we're rotating around, we can press the Alt key or press and hold the Alt key, I should say. And with that gesture, you'll snap the view into the nearest axis. So in this case, we're on the left perspective there. I'm going to middle click and keep moving around to here and then reverse that. So now we should be able to snap into the right perspective. So I'm just going to middle click and rotate around a little bit, hold alt, and it very quickly snapped into that right perspective for us. Now, something to mention on this is if we go to edit preferences and then find our navigation settings here, you'll notice that we have auto perspective on by default here. This means when we press say one on the numpad and we jump into front orthographic view and we middle click and rotate out of that view, it automatically snaps us into perspective, which for me personally, that's what I want most of the time. However, in this, I have noticed that if you want to use this Alt command, so for example, if I toggle the perspective view by pressing five on the numpad and then rotate into around here and then hold Alt, we've snapped into a nice right orthographic view. And if we hold Alt and then middle click and then snap to the top orthographic, it's all going to work fine. But as soon as we middle click and rotate out, we're snapped back to perspective. And now if I hold Alt, we're still in perspective as it snaps into that front view. So we might need to hit five again to toggle the orthographic. Or of course, hit F4, find your preferences and just disable that auto perspective if you don't like it. I mean, I guess it takes all sorts. Another huge handy feature that has been added is the new rendering engine Eevee. Now this is obviously a huge topic, so we're going to handle this more in another video, but it felt amiss not to at least include it in this chapter. Very briefly, we can come over to the rendering tab and here we'll find our rendering engine is set to Eevee by default. That's not something we're looking at right now. For Eevee to kick in, we're going to be needing to look at look dev or rendered mode. Very simply put, in look dev, we have this automatic world lighting. In fact, if we click on the down arrow there, you can choose between which world you would like to light your objects with. A couple of the extra options that we have here is to instead use the scene world or add our scene lights into the mix. If we were to enable both of these, it's basically going to act like we're in just rendered mode anyway. And we can see in our render tab, there's a whole lot of post processing options here that are really going to help things shine in real time. One of the more noticeable differences between 2.79 and 2.8 is the way that the outliner is working here. And in particular, the way it's working with these layers. Taking a look in 2.8, you can see we don't really have those layers anywhere here or at the top, those little dots. And in the outliner, you'll notice everything's grouped under this collection. We can double click on this collection and call it anything. So let's maybe call it camera and lights. And we have these three cubes selected. So maybe what we could do is press M to move them into a different collection, which is similar to 2.79, but we would have instead moved them to a different layer. So here I'm just going to click new collection and let's call this cubes, click okay. And now we'll see that there's the three cubes now under that collection. So we can kind of enable and disable layers by using this tick box. So now we can't see the cubes anymore, or now we can't see the camera and lights. And also you'll notice we have this visibility icon at the far right. Over in 2.79, you'll notice we have this selectability and renderability icons. They are still there. It's just by default, we don't really see them. If we come over to this little filter icon at the top, we can choose exactly what we want to see there. So there's our selectability option and there's our renderability option. And now I'll just click on the filter again. And now it's similar to how it was in 2.79. There is another option though. So I'm going to enable this disable in viewports icon also, this little monitor screen. And I'd also like to talk about the H for hiding key. So if we were to press H, that still works. And let's maybe hide this cube as well, select it, press H. And now what we can do is use Alt 
H to unhide everything. And we'll have noticed it's this little eye icon that is toggling on and off in these cases to hide those things. Now, the usefulness of this option, this disable in the viewports option is, especially if you have things like helper objects or something that's just there as reference and we've hidden them as we have here. And when we use Alt H, we don't really want to see them again. We can use this. It's kind of like a stronger way of hiding something, I suppose you could say. So now when we go Alt H, it's not going to come back. One other thing is that Shift H still works as hiding everything else except what we have selected. So if I go Shift H now, we'll hide the camera and light. And if we just go Alt H again, we'll unhide everything. Apart from the ones that were essentially saying, do not unhide these when we hit the Alt H unhide option. We were pretty much limited to just 20 layers before. Whereas in 2.80, we can press C to add in a new collection while our mouse is within the outliner there. And we can just keep adding them well beyond 20. Something else that it's worth noting, which is going to have an effect on what we see in the viewport here, is our view layers. By default, if we click on this icon, you can see we've just got this first one called view layer. I'm going to call this instead Cubulicious. And let's now click on this icon here to the right, which is going to duplicate that. And this one we'll call also Cubulicious. Now, something to note about that is that we can have different things visible. So for example, in this also Cubelicious, I'm gonna just disable the visibility of the lamp. And now if we go back to that other view layer, you can see the lamp is now enabled again. If we change the setting of our global visibility here, this is gonna transcend not just this view layer, but all view layers. So let's say we want those two cubes on, but just cube to O2 to not be seen, we'll see that that change has been reflected over in our also cubelicious. So cube.o2 is disabled. Finally, tying into the, what we see in the viewport here, we have to come to this menu, this object types visibility menu. And as you might be able to guess, we have easy access here, enabling or disabling the visibility or the selectability of the types of objects in our scene in one easy category. So let's remove the visibility of all our mesh objects and enable them again, or perhaps we wanna get rid of our lamps. And it's important to remember we have this here because as you can see in the outliner, if we're wondering why this lamp isn't having much of an effect on our scene, we're not gonna get much of a clue here. So we're gonna to need to come over here and just make sure we have that enabled. Luckily, these little icons will let us know if something's changed. So you can see the little eye there and the selectability arrow for that matter. So if we disable the selectability of meshes, we do get a little clue that we've done that. And similarly with the eye icon. While in 2.79, we had these various different windows layouts that we could switch between. In 2.80, instead we have these horizontally laid out at the top the workspaces. Now these aren't quite the same as just a window layout because we have this handy little tab in our properties window here with a workspace area and this is going to allow us to specify what mode we want each workspace to enter into. So for example if we have this object here, this cube, and we jump into the modeling workspace you'll notice quite a few things have changed. The rendering mode has switched us over into solid shading. We're actually now in edit mode in this object and it switched what tab we were looking at in our properties window. So if I switch back over to this context tab at the top and open up our workspace area, you can see we have the mode in which we can specify right there. If we jump into the sculpting workspace, you'll notice we're now in sculpt mode. So let's jump over to the context again and come down to the workspace area. You can see that's set there. And also, of course, you can see that we're set to use this mat cap and the background has changed a little bit. So with these various different workspaces, there's a few additional things in which we can change that we couldn't do before in 2.79's screen layouts. A quick additional thing I wanted to add to modes there is if we just add in an armature with Shift A, just move that off to the side so it's really clear and easy to see. And we went Control Tab to go into Pose Mode. If we wanted to now select this cube, we can't do it. And that is because if we go over to our Edit menu and find Lock Object Modes, you'll see this is enabled by default. If we uncheck it, we can select our cube now and then we can reselect our armature and see that it's still in Pose Mode. Switching to another workspace though, and then toggling back, it's gonna switch us back to object mode anyway, because of our workspace settings here in the mode. Another quick note to make about these is that we can actually filter add-ons as well. So we can have only certain add-ons available for certain workspaces. 
To demonstrate this a little bit better, what I've done is enabled a load of add-ons there. So in particular, coming over to the preferences window, I've filtered this by add mesh and I've enabled all of these. And also in the UV category, I've enabled the magic UVs. So let's switch this back to a 3D viewport. And you'll notice with the N key toggling our sidebar here, this is where we'll find many of our settings related to some of these add mesh add-ons. So while in our layout workspace, we can enable the filter add-ons checkbox, and then I've enabled them all except magic UV. If we enable that, you can see we get this little extra section here, which potentially once you get even more add-ons, maybe this is becoming a little bit more cluttered. So anyway, I've disabled that there. Jumping over to the UV editing workspace, I've again filtered all the add-ons and disabled all of them except this magic UV. Even the cycles rendering engine's been disabled. Another big improvement within Blender 2.80 is the grease pencil, which I'm really just going to gloss over here. But for more information, we can take a look at this link and in particular, the user manual here. That's got a lot of very useful information in it. In 2.79, we could hold down the D key and then left click and drag in the view to create some grease pencil stroke. You can see that in the outliner here. And if we press N to open up our property sidebar, a lot of the details that we would be working with are held here. In 2.80, instead of them being in that sidebar, we'll actually find them in the materials. And in addition to that, we can now find grease pencil objects in the add menu. So we can go shift A and find grease pencil there. And we've got blank stroke and a monkey, which has the most bells and whistles here. So let's click on the monkey, click the cube and let's delete it with X. So in the same way that we have the Suzanne mesh monkey, we now have the Suzanne grease pencil monkey. Let's select it. As you can see over here in the materials tab, we get these different types of materials. We have these solid colors and also these black outlines, for example, in this case. And we also have the various modes that we can enter into here. So we have our draw there and the edit mode. So if I left click and drag across the top there, for example, we can press G and move that up a little bit. Something else to note here is that we don't really have an appropriate workspace up at the top there. But if we click on file and new, we do have the 2D animation or we can go plus here and then go 2D animation to set things up there instead where we're now automatically entered into draw mode and we're ready to just start creating strokes. If we go from the file menu, file new, and then do 2D animation from here, we'll even get set up with uh, this bright background that we're completely ready to draw onto straight away. In addition to the materials tab in our properties window, we can also see we have this object data tab for just the grease pencil where we'll find things like layers and some of the useful settings. In addition to that as well, we also have effects. So for example, we can blur, we can pixelate, we can add some wave distortion that we could animate the phase value for, for example, to create some cool effects. And in addition to effects, we've also got grease pencil dedicated modifiers very briefly, for example, like opacity, which does exactly what you might think. And all of these others and probably many more to be introduced in the future. You'll notice we still have this annotate tool, which we can get to if we hold down D and left click into the view. We still have those features where we can make various different notes about what we're looking at in the viewport here. And we can hold D and right click to enter our eraser. But as you can see, this little triangle there means that we can left click and hold to get various different options. And we can also press N to open up our sidebar here, come down to the tool and find our various options here. So we can just X to remove all that. In 2.79, if we wanted to create a driver, we might come over to the properties of this cube and right click and manually create later, just this single X axis value here. I would then need to split the view, jump into the graph editor, switch this to drivers, select the X axis driver that we have. Now we can see it in the view here, give this a little bit more space, press N to open up this property sidebar, switch to the drivers tab, and then I'm gonna use the expression VAR, which is what's going on in this area. And let's take the camera's Y location, for example. So whatever the Y value of our camera is, that's going to inform the X axis value of the cube. Over in 2.8, that's way easier now. Now I can just right click and go add driver and we get this little window that pops up allowing us to edit that variable straight away. So I'm gonna change that to there. I'm gonna switch the object to the camera. Let's set that to the Y location and we're done. We can now select our camera and the X axis of our cube is being updated. And it's also really easy to just right click and then open that drivers editor. And then we'll see a dedicated window where we can refine that further. 
Here I've opened up another version of Blender that just has this simple arcade cabinet scene inside. I have this little object down here called cube.041, ingenious naming convention there. Now what we could actually do is just go control C and then copy that and then control V and that will paste that in as we can see there. But if I delete that with X and instead we found this blend file in a file explorer, which I have here, I can actually left click and drag that onto Blender and then we get the option to open it or link or append from it. So I'm just going to click append then I'm going to go into object and I'm going to find the very specific cube 041 and then append that from the library and we have it again. Here I've jumped into Blender 2.81 and inserted this section here. The file browser looks a little different now but mostly it's self-explanatory. There's a little tip that I wanted to share that I thought was an important thing to add. So especially for people opening up old Blender files in 2.8 and beyond. The interface layout is different enough that switching between 2.79 and 2.8 could be a bit disorientating once you get used to the new layout that is, especially with the flipped headers between the versions. There's an easy to miss feature here which is to open up the sidebar with the N key and then uncheck the load UI option. That will keep the UI in its 2.8 configuration and then you'll probably just need to reshuffle around the windows. That also means you still have easy access to the new workspaces. As it happens, that load UI option has been there for 2.79 and many versions before that, but the option was just a bit more noticeable. Now though, just remember to check behind the curtain that is the sidebar with the N key. Something else that's probably worth noting is that we can press F4, launch our preferences, find our add-ons, and have a look at all the available add-ons in here which may not have been available in the previous versions. Something that did catch my eye here, which I wanted to mention, and we can find it easily enough by just entering into the text filter the word kit, is this Blender Kit Asset Library. So I'm just gonna enable that there, and you'll find the login and sign up details, which should launch us into this website here for more details. I'm just going to show how simple this is in a very vanilla state though. So we'll find Blender Kit in the properties of the 3D view. So I'm going to exit that now and press N to bring open our sidebar and we'll find it down the side here on the Blender Kit. Up at the top we have the asset type and we're set to material here at the moment. Now the first time you launch this you might actually have the login details but you may just be able to press cancel and then you'll find all this show up. The profile stuff for the logging in is actually found just there as well. And then if we press animal, for example, Blender Kit is going to search and we can see it launches the asset bar as well, which we can hide here or show. And then if we mouse over them, you can see the various different materials that we have. Let's say I like this black dragon skin. I'm just going to click on it and we can see a little green bar, which is loading it right in and it's done already. So now I'm going to come over to look dev and if we zoom right in on this, we can see there's our material actually applied to this cube. Let's take a look at the shading workspace and take a look at the material that's just been created. Very, very basic, but with very, very little fuss, it's just downloaded all these textures for us and hooked them up to the appropriate sockets of our principal shader. So I'd say that it's pretty user-friendly. Now you may have noticed that it wasn't just materials that we had the option to bring in here. We could also set this to assets. I'm going to select free only. And uh, let's take a look at, hmm, space is an interesting one. Let's take a look at that. And here we have, whoa, this thing. So let's just click on this. And again, we're greeted with the download bounding box and general uploading progress green bar or green volume, I suppose it is. And then just give it a moment to compile. Let's get rid of this cube, X to delete, control space to go full screen. And now we have this object in our scene, which is looking really, really cool actually. So that just about wraps it up for now. But what of the future? 2.81 and beyond. Well, Blender, of course, is an ever evolving beast. For example, here's a discussion over at the DevTalk Blender.org site about the toolbar sidebar interface issue, which we briefly touched on earlier on, essentially trying to formalize and unify and maybe simplify generally the location of where you might find all your tools. And dependent on this discussion might inform a tweak in the layout in the future. Also worth checking out is this release notes link. And then here we can see Blender 2.81 now. Several things have already happened under the user interface. The outline has gotten some updates. Eevee is handling transparency even better now. There's new nodes within Cycles and Eevee. There's a new denoising algorithm included. Voxel remeshing for the sculpting and on and on and on. And it's always a good time for new features at the start of a new Blender iteration. So keep a lookout or just keep in contact with us on the socials. We'll likely be sharing out a lot of the cool stuff that we see. But that's going to wrap us up in this chapter.